Cause, and tell him, because you need the word in you, that's why. Amen. So I want to talk to you about becoming successful. And uh, one of the key elements of being the successful believers is our integrity. What we say is what we should do, and what we do is what we mean, and so forth. And uh, so I'm going to use a very unusual uh, individual from the Bible tonight to kind of give us an outlook of some things that we shouldn't be doing or allowing in our lives in order to bring us to a place of prosperity. So let's start out in the book of Job, chapter 36, verse 11. The title to our session tonight is What You Did Not Know About Judas. What You Did Not Know About Judas. Job 36, verse 11. Now, if you don't know who Judas was, he's the one who betrayed Jesus Christ and hung himself uh, for them. In Job 36, verse 11, it says this. If, everybody say if. If. If they obey and serve him, everybody say Jesus, Jesus. They shall spend their days in begging for bread. No, it says prosperity. Amen. Are the verses up on the screen? Okay, feel free to participate tonight. Hallelujah, glory to God. We might have church if we do. All right. They shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. Everybody say prosperity and pleasure. What are the two ingredients for enjoying prosperity and pleasure? According to the scripture right here, it says, number one, obedience and serving. Obedience and serving. When you don't serve, you don't get paid. Simple as that. Is that not true? You can't hold down a job, never show up, clock in and do the work if you expect to get paid. So this scripture is telling us how to spend our days in prosperity and our years in pleasure. That's a lifelong commitment of serving God and God in return rewards you for your efforts. Let's go to verse 12. But if they obey not, they shall perish by the sword, and they shall die without knowledge. Now, what does that mean, perish by the sword and die without knowledge? To perish by the sword means that things won't go the way you planned. I see this a lot in, in teenagers when they're growing up. Yeah, I'm going to get a job playing Nintendo, and I'm going to rescue the princess, and at the end of every castle run, I'm going to get gold. No, I don't think so. You're going to have to work at McDonald's like everybody else. So it says they'll perish by the sword. Things won't go the way you planned. And then it says they'll die without knowledge. What does that mean? That means you will try to figure out what the heck happened. Why didn't it go the way that I wanted it to go? And according to Job right here, there's two main ingredients that needs to be observed. Obedience and serving. All right? Now, let's go to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19. Let me just set a foundation for you then. Is anybody interested in being prosperous? All right. Is anybody just interested in enjoying pleasure in life? Pleasure in life means you have the good things, okay? It doesn't mean necessarily you're a fat cat, you can do whatever you want to and just sin. That's not what it's talking about. But you're enjoying the good things in life. Let's go to Isaiah 119 and verse 20. If you're willing and obedient, everybody say there's that word obedient again. But it just added another word, willing. If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. And, but if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword and by the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So the next ingredient of a God-ordained life is you have to be willing. So you have to be willing, you have to be willing to obey, and you have to be willing to serve. These are the three keys that God ordained for a lifestyle that is pleasing unto God. That's reaching that hundredfold lifestyle that everybody reads about and desires to have. Obedience, serving, and willingness. Let's say it together. Obedience, serving, and willingness. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 20. So, I'm just going to set a foundation still. So, Join the company of good men and women. Everybody say men and women. Keep your feet on the tried and true path. It's the men who shall, uh, it's the men who walk straight who will settle this land 
and the women with integrity who will last here. Now, he's giving you some components right now. In order for you to stay on course, you have to have integrity. Integrity means doing what you say and saying what you, what you mean. And just, you know, being true to your word. Integrity is a lost art nowadays. Because we say that we're going to do things and then we just kind of end up not doing them. And then we don't make any effort to make things right. Or we don't call and say, hey, I'm not going to be able to attend or I'm not going to be able to do this function. We just kind of let it go. And then the next time we see that person, we make some kind of excuse. How many of you know I'm telling the truth? Amen. All right. Turn to somebody and say, but he wasn't talking about you. So let's go a little bit deeper now. In the book of John, chapter 13, verse 18, I'm just laying a foundation. Jesus is saying this. I am not including all of you in this. Turn to somebody and say, you might be exempt. Now, before you say that again, though, he's talking about Judas Iscariot. He's talking to the 12 disciples, and he's about to reveal to them that he's about to be betrayed and so forth. And so you may be thinking, well, what does integrity and being willing and being obedient and willing to serve have anything to do with prosperity? It all ties in, but I want to show you some elements of Judas Iscariot's life that he did not display that cost him his discipleship. According to the book of Acts, he had something called a bishopric, which means that not only was he supposed to be an apostle, but he was supposed to be a bishop. He was supposed to have oversight of other churches and ministries. But it was taken from of him because of some characteristics that he developed in his lifestyle. So let's read it uh, uh, again. I'm not including you all in all of this. I know precisely, everybody say precisely, who I have selected. So, uh, as not to interfere with the fulfillment of the scripture, the one who ate, uh, ate and bread at my table turned his heel against me. So integrity is how you, is how you are when no one is looking. It's not what you do in front of people. Integrity is how you are when no one's looking. What's going on behind closed doors? Because in front of each other, we can all act like a Christian. We can all speak Christianese. We can all say, hallelujah, praise the Lord, amen, get thee behind me, Satan. But how are you behind closed doors when you get frustrated? Do you fuss and cuss or do you still say hallelujah? All right, now, turn to somebody and say, he's going to get there. So this verse is in reference to Judas Iscariot. So I want to look at Judas's life for just a moment. And I want to pull out some things that you may not have recognized or known that was character deficiencies that for three and a half years, Jesus was trying to work on building his character, but he failed the tests. And when you look at, when you look at Bible examples of men and women in the Bible, you can learn great faith or you can learn how to be a great failure. If you repeat what they did, then you repeat their defeat. But if you learn from them and so forth, and that's what the Bible tells us the Bible is for, that the people in the Old Testament are an example for us in the New, so we don't repeat their defeat. Turn to them and say, don't repeat the defeat. So we're going to look at the life of Judas for a moment and learn from his mistakes. Number one, Judas constantly stole God's money. So let me just start out with the bat out, right out of the chute and make everybody uncomfortable. Judas constantly stole God's money. In the book of John, chapter 12, verse 6, it says this. He did this not because he cared, okay, uh, two cents about the poor, but because he had the bag. He was a thief. Wait, page 2, okay. He was in charge of their common funds, but also embezzled them. Everybody say embezzled. He stole from the ministry. He stole from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now, survey indicates that only 5% of American Christians tithe. That means out of 10 people, one person actually...
being at a prayer meeting. And there's a lot of believers who'll come to church, and when a, world, when a church-wide prayer is announced, most folks don't. What they'll do is they'll put on an emoji on Facebook, but that's as far as they'll go. Turn to them and say, well, he's not talking about me. So Judas is off making plans with the enemy. Only a handful of church members have ever come to a prayer service. This church is very weak on prayer services. We've tried several times to have intercessor prayer. It just does not fly. You know why? The answer is because it's not entertainment. And because it's not entertainment, people no longer come to church. Most church services have stopped being places of worship and now start becoming concerts. Most churches don't have anything where it deals with sacrifice. Now it's all about self-indulgence. Am I talking too much truth here? Okay. So even the church should be called a house of prayer. We only come to a time of prayer when there's a national emergency or there's an issue taking place that everybody's kind of uh, leaning towards. But other than that, how many is really praying for lost souls to be saved? How many is still praying for people to join the church and for God to increase the church like it says we should be doing in the book of Acts? How many people are still interceding for people who go in and out of the hospital constantly and binding up sicknesses and diseases? How many people are being sensitive to the spirit that when somebody comes in on a Sunday morning and they have a bad look on their face, instead of judging them, saying they got a bad attitude, you might be thinking, well, they might have a demon. I should go over there and cast that thing out. Are you getting any of this? And so because it's not entertaining, most people don't attend. When we announce a night of worship, people scream. When we announce uh, other things at times, you can hear crickets chirping in the background. Is that too hard? Turns out to say, he always does that to us. Number three, Judas skipped important teaching sessions. In the book of Luke, chapter 22, verse 3 and 4, it says, that's when Satan entered Judas, the one called Iscariot. He was one of the twelve. Leaving the others, he conferred with the high priests uh, at the, te- uh, the high priests and the temple guards about how he might betray Jesus. Jesus is doing a teaching. He's having a meeting with them. And what's Judas doing? He's all running off. He's meeting with the religious folks, not so he can, you know, be ministered to. He's looking for money in his pocket. Most folks are Sunday morning Christians only. Let me say that. Dun, dun, dun. Okay? And you've got to understand something. The purpose of the word, the Bible says that God has given us the word, the loose translation is, so it can bring us conviction. Meaning, if there's things in life that we need to adjust so we can enter into the blessings and the promises of God, then make the adjustment. Don't act like the, tre- the preacher is beating you down. The preacher is trying to get you to prosper. The preacher is trying to get you to live a prosperous life, to have good things in life. But we think because of our partial disobedience that God should bless us anyways, and it doesn't work. And so we have a lot of people that are struggling because they think that they're obedient when they're not being obedient. They think they're serving, but they're not really serving, just showing up. Showing up is not doing uh, God a favor. Showing up is doing you a favor because God is trying to teach you something or God is trying to show you something or the Holy Spirit is trying to deliver you from something. God always has a purpose for everything that goes on in your life. And that's the hard lesson to learn. Lord, why am I going through the difficulty? Well, there's a lesson to be learned. Sometimes it's because of a satanic attack. Sometimes it's because of human neglect. But either way, God can get the glory out of it. We just got to look away. We just got to look in the right place. Am I talking to anybody? And so here, you know, Satan entered into Judas because Judas never paid attention to anything. Okay? So most folks on Sunday are Sunday morning Christians only. And those are the ones that are constantly struggling. The more time you spend in the gym, the more your muscles get worked out. You don't eat just one meal a week. Why would you think that's okay with your spirit? Turns out he's not talking about you. He's talking about the people watching us. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the people watching us. All right, let's go another one. Ready? 
Are we learning from Judas? All right, turn to somebody. He's not talking about you, so relax. Judas was comfortable fellowshipping with the Lord's enemies. Judas was comfortable fellowshipping with the Lord's enemies. The Bible says, mark those that cause division and strife and have nothing to do with them. And we've experienced that many times here because people are people, you know, for whatever reason or however their interpretation is. Now, notice this. In the book of Mark, chapter 14, and immediately, even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. And they had been sent by the leading priests and the teachers of religious law and the elders. Many church folks have two sets of friends. They have Christian friends and they have enemies of the cross. We have Christian friends and enemies of the cross. And what is that? That's the same kind of standard that Judas Iscariot had. The Bible says that bad friends can corrupt good morals. If you have a person with a sour attitude, it's just a matter of time before they turn you. It's just spending time with them. That's it. Let me give you another one. Turn to someone and say, I'm so glad he's not talking to me. Number five. Judas never cared for the poor and needy, but only for himself. Judas never cared for the poor and needy, but only for himself. In the book of Matthew, chapter 26, it says this. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went into the leading priests and asked, How much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? And they offered him thirty pieces of silver. Many Christians carry only, uh, I'm sorry, many Christians care only, okay, and they come to church to, many Christians only come to church to get the blessings. Gone are the days I'm here to sow, I'm here to serve, I'm here to sacrifice. And that movement started in the 80s. I'm here for my blessing. What happened to serving? The Bible says that Jesus came down in the form of a man. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he took on the form of a servant. And the Bible says that Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve. If he's our example, then serving is something that we should be doing. Serving is ministry. The word minister means to serve and to sow and to sacrifice. People aren't looking for sowing anymore. They want harvest. See how our conversation has changed and so forth? And this is why the power of God has gone out of most churches now, and they had to switch from the power of God and the presence of God to entertainment. So most people choose not to serve. They rarely sow. And if you talk about sacrifice, the first thing they'll do is get defensive and say, well, I've got issues on my own. We've all been there. But that's not the reason and the purpose that Jesus came. This is not the reason and purpose Jesus saved us because the Bible says that he saved us so that we may serve, to bring him good pleasure, okay? Turns to them and say, I'm so glad this is not us. Here's an interesting one. Judas never called Jesus Lord, only Rabbi. Never called him Lord, Rabbi. Then Judas... Already in, in the book of Matthew 26, verse 25, forgive me. Then Judas, already turned traitor, said, it isn't, uh, it isn't me, is it, Rabbi? And Jesus said, don't play games with me, Judas. Never called him Lord. Because lordship means surrender. That means I'm not in charge of me no more. I'd love to have an attitude, but God won't let me have one. I'd love to just go ahead and unload on somebody, but God wants me to bite my tongue. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Amen. That lordship is very difficult. That love walk, Arthur and I, we all... It's a very hard thing to do. But if you'll notice, when Jesus is your Lord, then you're totally surrendered to him. Then we can sing that song, I Surrender All. But Judas never called him Lord. Many Christians refuse to submit to Jesus' lordship. How can you tell? Because 
They see the things of God as options. Do you feel like going to church today? Well, no, not really. It's an option. What do you think? Should we give into the ministry? Well, you know, we need to hold on for what we got. We need gas money. Are you getting any of this? Instead of realizing commandments. And that's a hard concept for us now because we are living in the times that we're in and we are a free-thinking, free-will society and we've got this mindset, well, we can't have people telling us what to do. But that's what the whole thing about lordship is, is God knows what's best for us and we don't. Now, I don't know about you. I figured out that God was smarter than me than a long time ago, didn't you? Amen. You did not have to say amen so quickly to that. <laughs> Here's another one. Turn to someone and say, I'm glad these are not you. All these things that I'm showing you is a lack of integrity. See, when God blesses you, he's going to bless you financially. But he holds you accountable to do something with the finances. If God has gifted you, then he holds you accountable to the gift. It says so in Corinthians that you'll stand before him. What did you do with your gift? God is going to hold us accountable for the things. And what we think is judgment delayed is judgment denied. Just because it's not happening now. But integrity will make you want to do things for God. Whether it's in the here and now or not. Just because you love God, not because you have to or because someone's telling you to or encouraging you. You do it because you're in love with him and that's your motive. You do what you do because you're in love with Jesus. Here's another one. Judas was obsessed with material things. Many Christians are only interested in getting their stuff, getting their blessings. If they don't get what they've been praying for, they get mad at God. Some people I've even heard threaten God. Well, I'm just not going to blah, 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 blah. Wow. I would never do that. I'm too afraid. I've done it before. How stupid I was. Because I found out no matter, even if, even if I throw a fit, and I don't know about you, you may be his favorite. I thought I was. Even if I throw a fit, it still doesn't move God's throne. Anybody else found that out but me? All right, we're going to start a support group over this. <laughs> Many Christians are only interested in getting their stuff. You can hear that in a lot of conversations. I'm here to get my blessings. I'm here to get mine. If you don't get yours, I'll get yours too. So we want more stuff nowadays than we do as presents. And so I don't know about you. I'm desperate for his presence. I, I pray the prayer of Moses sometimes. Lord, I don't want to step outside of my tent unless your presence goes with me. Because you don't know what's going to be going on. Something could jack you up in a moment. Let's go a little bit further. Anybody learning? Turn to someone and say, I'm glad he's not talking about me tonight. Here's one. Number eight, Judas never stayed in one place. In book of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 14, it says, Judas, Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the leading priests. So he's all constantly church hopping. Many Christians are either skip church altogether or they're hopping from one church to another. And usually, the reason they hop from one church to another is because they have some kind of disagreement with the pastor. Forgetting the scripture that says that God is the one who puts that pastor into your life for your benefit, not for you to get along. Ooh, 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 wah, wah, wah. And so this is why there's a lot of rogue ministries started, because there's some kind of a disagreement. It happened in the book of Acts between Paul and, and, and another disciple who I can't think off the bat right now. They got into a fist fight mentioned in the scriptures. Let me give you one more. Well, let me give you a couple more. Well, maybe one more. Number nine, Judas was partially concerned about Jesus. That means he could take it or leave it. If something more exciting came along, he, t uh, he, he, he would leave it. We see this happening for years in church. People get into trouble. They have issues. 
They come to church, they cry, they want counseling, they want ministering. They go from person to person to person, tell their story, they're weeping, they have people praying with them, and they come for a while, then God begins to turn their situation around, and poof, they're gone. And you don't see them for a while, a couple of months, maybe a year or three, then they're back, another issues, here come the tissues, and the, and the cycle repeats itself. But did you know that if you had integrity and you maintain a consistent lifestyle that is a consistent walk with God, that you would be walking in a better, a better level of prosperity and health and wellness and everything else, it's easier to maintain something than it is to fix something. Is that not true? All right. So Judas was partially concerned about G Jesus in the book of Mark, chapter 14, verse 44. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomever shall I kiss, the same is he. Take him and lead him away safely. Now, how can you tell an angry mob, settle down, don't hurt him? When the very thing he went to do was to betray them. He knew what the high priests were going to do. The punishment for blasphemy was getting the whip. It was known as the second death. They're going to pull the skin off of his body. And so he's making it sound like he's concerned. Well, you know, if you're going to arrest him and like a mob and stuff like that, just be careful, don't hurt him. It's a mob. And so he was only partially concerned. He was more into it, but was in it for himself, and that was the 30 pieces of silver. Many claim allegiance to Jesus, but you couldn't tell them by their lifestyle. Your lifestyle is a reflection of how much light of the Word of God is burning inside you. Notice how quiet it got in this Baptist church. It's okay. The Bible says we have all sinned and fallen short. He's got us covered. I don't know about you. Whoo! Thank you, Jesus. I need a white hanky, somebody. Ha <laughs> ha. Most believers, because of this, they can't endure sound doctrine or sound teachings. They want the fluffy pancake feel-good messages instead of the, Lord, is there anything inside me that is a hidden sin? I need you to remove it far from me as far as the east is from the west so I may be pleasing in your sight. That's what it's about. And so we don't endure sound doctrine. We consider things like this as a hard teaching. Pastors getting on to us. I hate these correction teachings. These are things that bring prosperity. These are things that bring abundance. These are the things that we talked about in the book of Job that brings the blessings and opens up the windows of heaven and God because we're trying desperately to be an obedient people. And obedience pays off. Rebellion does not. Amen? Amen? Turn to someone and say, he just says it like it is. So anything that even sounds remotely like correction, we just have an aversion to it. You can always tell when the Holy Spirit is convicting people because they're sitting in church, and next thing you know, they look like this. <laughs> and they don't want the preacher to look at them like, you, you know, they just got, you just got busted, man, by the Holy Ghost, put a cap in you. Here's another one. Ready? Number 10. Judas did not see his acting as a betrayal. He didn't think he was doing anything wrong. He thought he was doing a service. Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus said, well, you said it, dude. He was trying to act all innocent, like, what? I can't believe anybody would betray you. Oh my goodness, you're kidding me. Do you think that Christians count their selfishness or disobedience as rebellion? We never think of it. We always think it's the other person. We always blame the other person, but we never see what's really in the mirror because surely not I. How many of you know what I'm talking about? 
turn to somebody and say, Ah, say, fa. That's that religious thing going on. And so if we maintain our integrity, and if we're willing, if we're obedient, and if we're willing to serve and to sow and to sacrifice, that's Christianity. That's how the early church started. When the early church took off, if you ever studied church history or church records, people had to qualify to belong to a church. You had to prove that you loved the Lord. You had to prove that you were walking away from the things of the world. You had to prove that you were endeavoring to overcome sin in your life. These things had to be proven, and then the church body had to vote on whether you passed the test or not. God would move upon the people. Now we just kind of drift in and out and back and forth. And we've made it so convenient because we don't like this one word, and that's accountability. We don't like being accountable. We don't like being corrected. We don't like being told what to do. But yet, it's for this reason that God has called every one of us into the ministry. We are all called to, we're all saved. We've all been saved to serve. Our job is to go into a dying, sighing world and to reach the loss. And sometimes we have to carry our cross, and sometimes that cross is brutal. And you're not the most popular, and things won't go your way, and the devil really hates you. But we're called to carry that cross anyways and to be an example. When everybody else would quit, you choose to lace up your boots and say, you know what, this is for the king and the kingdom. It has nothing to do with me personally. And you go on, Christian soldier. Now, again, do you think most Christians count their uh, selfishness or disobedience or behavior as rebellion? We never see it as ourselves. We always see it as the other person. And that's what Judas was doing here. Hey, Jesus is your guys' problem, not me. I'm just a guy trying to make a buck. That's what Judas' mentality was. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, did you learn anything tonight? You used to live in sin. Everybody say used to. Just like the rest of the world. Obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Now, notice it uses the word obey. And there's the key. Obey means you know what you're supposed to do, but you're, not, you're choosing not to do it anyways. I think one of the worst killers in, in, in believers' lives is procrastination. Just putting things off. Procrastination is the Bible way of saying slothfulness. Slothfulness doesn't mean you're lazy. It just means you're not in gear and you're not productive. And Jesus had a teaching about an unproductive servant. So it says, you used to live in sin. Turn to someone and say, that's what I used to do. Turn to somebody else and say, but I don't obey the world no more. See, obeying the world is obeying your flesh. It's checking with your feelings. The Bible says that we need to put our flesh under subjection. How many of you know the biggest enemy in your life is not the devil, but it's your flesh? That's it. All right. So what it says here, let me read it again. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. So when you're living in sin, you're obeying the devil, okay? So disobeying God means that you're obeying the devil. Simple as that. Disobeying God means... You're obeying the devil. What is it that God has instructed you to do that? Maybe you're not doing it yet. Then who's your master? Who's the Lord over your flesh? I don't know about you. Overcoming the flesh is very difficult, but it can be done. Why? Because the Apostle Paul said it. He said, I put my body under subjection. What that means is my body and my feelings don't tell me what to do. I tell my body and my feelings what to do. My body, my feelings are not in charge. Well, I just have the bad day. Well, you know what? We all do. 
Now, there's a difference between that and just needing a brain break. Having to have a mental health break is understandable. Okay? But don't let that become your lifelong excuse. Am I talking to anybody? Why? Because we're called to be overcomers. Let's do one more. Let's do one more verse and I'll let you go. Turn and say, pardon me, that smell is my flesh burning. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. How many of you want to be prosperous? How many of you want to be uh, 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 pleasing in the Lord's eyes? How many of you, when you stand before him, you want to hear him say, enter in the good and faithful servant? I, that's what I want to hear. I don't want, to, I don't want him to go, John Pelizari, who in the Sam Hill are you? Can you check the books again? Because that's not even funny. 2 Corinthians 13.5. Test yourselves to make sure you are solid in the faith. So you're supposed to test yourself. Don't drift along, taking everything for granted. Give yourselves a regular checkup. Turn to someone and say, it's time for a checkup from the neck up. You need firsthand evidence, not mere hearsay, that Jesus Christ is in you. So if you're called on the carpet today, what would you say is your evidence that Jesus is in you? Because faith without works is dead. Now it says this, test it out. If you fail the test, do something about it. See how easy God is? Do something about it. If you feel you've been lacking behind or if you've been in neutral or... You've been struggling and so forth. It says right here, do something about it. Don't ever let the enemy believe that what he's using on you is going to work. Like the Bible says, girt up your loins. You know what that means? Pull your britches up. Girt up your loins. Pull your britches up. Put your combat boots on and get back into the fight. Amen? Amen? In order for you to walk... In your God-given inheritance, you have to meet the covenant conditions. And so I wanted you to see some aspects of Judas' life, of things that he didn't do, or things that he thought he was getting away with, which cost him dearly. Because if you think about it, if you think about it, from a theological standpoint, hermeneutical, pharmaceutical, paralytical, whatever, I just wanted to say something ethical. If you think about it, if the book of Acts says that Judas lost his bishopric, that he should have been a bishop in church, in our Bible today, there could have possibly been the book of Judas, and it would have been an authentic gospel if he stayed with God. But he didn't. Now, that sounds far-fetched to some of you, but we have a record in the book of Acts of the apostles. We have historical records of what the apostles did, how they lived, how they died. Judas, he died early in the game. All because he was in it for the short run instead of the long haul. And one of the things I want to encourage everybody, especially as we're seeing things in the news developing and the hardness of life and the difficulties, make sure you're in it for the long haul. Don't give in. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't run. Don't let the devil think that what he can use on you is going to work. Because the devil's best has never been and never will be good enough. You know why? Because you've been bought by the blood of the Lamb. And victory is your portion. It's already been ordained for you to, to walk in victory. So now the choice is yours. Am I going to maintain my integrity? Despite my circumstances, will I obey? Despite what I'm going through, will I continue to serve? Am I going to do it with joy? Or am I going to let the pressures of this world, or am I going to let my feelings and emotions, or my thoughts, or what he said, she said, 
Is that going to interfere with my blessings? Is that going to interfere with my heavenly rewards? Is that going to interfere with my obedience to God? Because I don't know about you, I want to pray the prayer of David in Psalms. Lord, if there's anything between me and you, he called it a secret sin. If there's any secret sins between me and you, remove it far from me as the east is from the west. Because I don't know about you, the thing I long to hear the most is enter in that good and faithful. Don't you? Yeah. Amen. Did you learn something tonight? Give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. I want to do a corporate prayer. <clears throat> if you've been maybe struggling in your walk or maybe you need a, a, a booster shot or something like that, would you just kind of stand where you're at? Just stand where you're at. We just want to pray for you. Don't want anybody to give in, give up. The enemy may be tempting you. You may have been going through a high-pressure situation. Maybe you're facing a couple of challenges and so forth. Now is not the time to give up. And I want you to know you're not alone. Now the rest of you sitting, I want you to stretch your hands in several directions towards these other believers. And we're going to pray a prayer of faith. Hallelujah. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters right now in the name of Jesus. We know that as the spirit of age is reaching its climax, as the spirit of age is coming to an end, the book of Daniel tells us that the enemy is going to try to wear out the saints in these last days with great and swelling words, with persecution, with tribulations, with hard and difficult times, with pressure. But Lord, we also know that corporate prayer, coming together as a church family, we can pray and uplift one another in the beauty of holiness. And so as we release our faith over our church family, those that are watching in whatever venue that they're using right now, that the spirit of heaviness be removed. That heaviness be removed and that the spirit of joy be released right now in Jesus' name. We thank you for joy unspeakable. We thank you, Father God, in the name of Jesus, that you're the one who can still remove mountains. You're the one who can still part waters. You're the one who can still roll away the things of the enemy. You can still cause the enemy's camp to be dispersed before us. Lord, we thank you that you're scattering our enemies right now seven different ways. We thank you for the victory that you have ordained us to be. We thank you that as we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, all we're doing is walking through it. We're not camping here. We're not buying a house. And we're not calling it home. And Father, we thank you as we pray for this encouragement, for the spirit of joy to be released upon your people once again in Jesus' name as we go out in these last days with joy in our hearts, knowing that we can look up and that we are the church triumphant in our comings and our goings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. <laughs>